Ladies and gentlemen, welcome at our embassy. Uh, thank you for accepting our invitation to join today's venue aimed in commemorating the 30th anniversary of the establishment of the Slovak Republic as an independent nation in 1993. The first of the Slovakia at 30 series features an ambassador, Radovan Javorčík, in a conversation on 30 years of Slovak foreign policy. This event is co-organized by our fraternal groups, Friends of Slovakia and Slovak American Society of Washington, and we thank them for all their endeavor in this collaborative project. Mr. Ambassador will be interviewed by the Friends of Slovakia Vice Chair, Martin Kahrvalova. Martin, thank you so much for being with us. We hope that you will enjoy this evening and stay tuned for other networking and public diplomacy activities during this year. Please stay with us following up on this event. There will be a nice reception and we hope you will enjoy our refreshments. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction and good afternoon everyone. Welcome once again to the embassy and also to our online audience that's connecting both here from the United States uh, and overseas, primarily Slovakia. Uh, I'll only add to the introduction uh, that Stanka already provided you with that Slovakia 30 is a series of four um, distinguished lessons uh, with expert speakers, starting uh, with ambassador, followed by speakers such as the deputy former Deputy Prime Minister of Slovakia, Ivan Miklos, on economy, uh, other experts on civil society and domestic politics. With that, uh, I'm going to move uh, into the conversation with Ambassador, but before I do that, let me start with a couple of reminders. Um, this uh, session is recorded and it will be also distributed to our online participants after the event. Uh, our online participants will have the opportunity to ask questions using a Slovak uh, app. Uh, Slido, and uh, we will also have a mic uh, for the guests here at the embassy to ask questions following ambassadors' opening remarks. Uh, again, my name is Martina Hrvolova, and I'm the vice chair of uh, Friends of Slovakia. Uh, because we have a lot to cover, I'm going uh, to jump straight into the conversation with Ambassador. Uh, but if you could bear with me for a couple uh, more minutes, uh, let me introduce him briefly. He doesn't really need much introduction, especially uh, to the audience here at the Embassy. Uh, but I'll at least uh, briefly highlight some of the key points uh, in his professional career. We all know that he arrived uh, to the United States in January 2021. Um, I believe he came straight from NATO, where he was a permanent representative of Slovakia to NATO, but his prior posts also include uh, ambassadorial uh, position in Israel. Um, he was also a deputy uh, ambassador in London. And ever since the beginning, um, from mid-90s, when he started his professional uh, foreign service career, he's been in uh, several management positions, focusing primarily on North America and defense. Uh, my favorite fun fact about him is that he's a mechanical engineer by education, but he is, of course, uh, also educated in international affairs. Again, because we have a lot to cover, uh, let me now turn to Ambassador and ask him to kindly provide, uh, provide his introductory remarks. Ambassador. Thank you, Martina, and thank you for all of you who uh, came to the embassy through the traffic and to all the, the viewers on on internet. Uh, Martin, I was uh, afraid that you would ask me where I was uh, 30 years ago exactly. Uh, I, I really don't know. Uh, most probably I was at home and getting ready for my uh, exams uh, the last year at the university. Uh, but I know when I was on the 1st January 93, I was um, in, uh, in Yasna in a ski resort um, uh, celebrating the New Year's Day and uh, becoming a Slovakia independent democratic uh, state. And uh, in the morning on the 1st of January, there was a bunch of uh, Czech tourist skiers coming down the slopes and their reaction was like, and I, I will say it in, in Czech and then I will, I will translate it to English. Hele, my jsme v cizine. Oh my God, we are, we are in a foreign country. <laughs> that, that, was, that was a shock of um, 1993, you know, one day you are skiing in your own country and then you don't change the slope and you're in a foreign country. Um, but but uh, to, to, to have a small introduction of, um, um, of the 30 years of uh, Slovakia and, um, and diplomacy of Slovakia, let me have a brief um, remarks on three decades, each decade, um, for, uh, as I see it from the political, economic, and uh, sort of fun side of, uh, side, fun side of history. Um, 
the, the first decade was obviously uh, the state building and definition of Slovakia. We emerged from uh, from from uh, the, the joint state of the joint country with with Czechs with no currency, no central bank, no army. Well, there was some army there. There were army officers from the Czechoslovak army, but there was no like a formal um, general staff, um, no diplomatic service, and and many uh, assets which were federal were either not de de devolved um, immediately, but or they were devolved as we were um, uh, starting our, our independence. Uh, so the with the start of the of of, of the Slovak um, Republic was uh, really interesting, and it, it was not not uh, fun for many. Um, but what I can say is that the the separation with with the Czechs was amicable on on both sides. Obviously, if we want to poke an eye of each other we can take some some silly uh stories from that uh, that that, that, um, that um from from uh, from that uh, period of time but we don't do that except for for ice hockey um so the the first uh, first decade was really about um trademark uh, identity of slovakia and and we started as a, as a country which had no identity or had an identity of oh those who wanted to separate from the czechs that was that was the the buzzword of people who didn't know too much about uh, about Slovakia, and luckily enough, uh, the the leadership of Slovakia of, of that time, uh, already in February '93, um, adopted the first foreign policy strategic document, uh, which clearly said that Slovakia will become a member of NATO, European Union, which is only one year old uh, according to the, to, uh, to to the, the treaties, and we will be part of the political West. Uh, the only thing was how to get it. We had the goal, but the way was a little bit uh, unknown. And as we learned over those 10 years, the, the first decade, uh, this was really painful, uh, painful um, road. We were called the uh, black hole of uh, Europe or black hole in Europe. Um, the state institutions helped uh, to kidnap the president's uh, son. Um, privatization was... Um, and everything but not transparent, uh, economy was uh, coming down. Uh, the first year were not pleasant uh, for, for any dip diplomat to, to make a call for, for Slovakia. But we had a civic society which was built also through uh, help of, uh, of United States and uh, many um, Western friends. And this one, the, the civic society, just um, uh, came to the um, ramparts of democracy, and uh, uh, there was a change in 1998. Uh, I, I have to say that uh, at that, that moment, um, uh, that, that was the, the period of time when I had the, the worst professional and personal moment of, of my life, when in 1999, when the Czech Republic, Hungary, and Poland were joining NATO, and we were standing at NATO headquarters like uh, outcasts, not being with them. And when the Czech anthem was played, there was a lull. It was the Moravian part of the Czechoslovak anthem, and there was no Slovak coming in. So this was really like a, one of the worst moments for everybody uh, who was standing there. Next to me was Ambassador Burian, who was ambassador here, Ambassador Korczak, who was, uh, um, who was ambassador here as well. So this was the bunch of people who was feeling very, very sick and bad. Uh, but we ended up um, on a cheerful side of, 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 the, of the decade. Um, we basically were invited to, to NATO, we were invited to the European Union, and everything started to, to look uh, pretty, pretty nicely. On the economic side, uh, we ended up the decade with a certain Mr. Forbes uh, um, branding Slovakia tiger um, of, uh, of Europe, European tiger. So that was not a bad ending of economy. And on the top of it, we had US, US Steel coming to Slovakia, Volkswagen coming to, to Slovakia, lots of uh, uh, investment coming in. On the funny side, uh, we started uh, you know, the, uh, the decade uh, quite nicely. Uh, the um, Olympic Games in Lillehammer, ice hockey team once again performed perfectly. Miro Shatan and the others, Peter Bondra was there as well. So it was really, really nice. We had the first uh, concert of three great tenors in in uh, Košice. Nobody expected that. It was it was fabulous. Uh, but as identity of Slovakia, I would say um, the the first decade was really uh, dominated by 9/11. Uh, uh, by the terrorist attack on, on the United States and our reaction to that. The second 
decade of, of Slovakia uh, was a uh, um, time of consolidation and coming to, uh, to be a good member of NATO and the and, uh, and, uh, European Union. Uh, and we became uh, part of the core of European Union and, and Europe. We, were, we became uh, members of the Eurozone. We were part of Schengen. So we're just accomplishing all those good things which, which, uh, which started to happen at the end of the 90s. Economy, uh, once again, it was booming. The GDP was growing, growing nicely. The Eurozone benefits were, were there. We didn't use any funny money. And, uh, you know, Euro is still one of the uh, cherished uh, accomplishments of, uh, of 90s. On identity side of, of Slovakia, I, w- I would say that they were, they were definitely Schengen uh, visa waiver with the United States. That was really a defining moment, which um, Slovakia on, on different footing than uh, other countries uh, of Europe. We became a member of OECD once again. We were a part of uh, the, the best club. Once again, I will take Košice. Košice became a European uh, uh, capital of, of culture, which was really, really important thing. And uh, in 2010, uh, we beat Italy in the Soccer World Cup in South Africa. So everything was nice, pinky, rosy, and everything was fine. Then the, then, then the third, third decade. Uh, this perhaps is most uh, difficult to, to define what, what was it. Um, but I, I think it, it ended with another good and nice perhaps not nice, good soul-searching uh, again. Um, the, 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 the third decade started with a mood of uh, Slovakia, like being an island of peace and, and tranquility where nothing is happening. And we, if we st- stay away from the troubles, the troubles will somehow overlook us. Uh, unfortunately, in reality, this was not the truth. And uh, unfortunately, our guards came off and um, things like... Uh, Populism, uh, socialism with nationalist uh, agenda, which if you reverse it, national socialism started to come back to, uh, to the political c- scenery. Fascists became uh, part of uh, the parliament and uh, corruption became buzzword in, in Slovakia. So this was something which, which was not expected, perhaps, and not, not welcome. And if, if I jump to identity part of the uh, third decade, I, I, I would I would say that um, the the first identity pattern was election of a first president who was not a communist, member of the Communist Party, first president lady, lady president. Uh, but unfortunately, we had to um, re- reconcile with the murder of uh, Jan Kuciak. I think this was another defining moment of of, um, of Slovakia and definitely of the third third decade. Um, and once again, it was a civic society which was helped, um, which was built through the assistance and, and help of uh, friends from the United States and others. Was the one uh, which which saved the the future of, of Slovakia as a country, which is not progressive in U.S. terms, but progressive in a way of uh, getting forward uh, in a positive way. Um, economy. I, I have to say that the third decade was perhaps the revelation of the mistakes of the past. Um, I can remember from the first decade of, of Slovakia when people were saying, well, Russia is a nice country to do the business. Uh, let's not um, overestimate possible weaponization of uh, gas and oil. Ah, this, this is all the past. This is Cold War. This is, this is not uh, coming to, to the front. And we have it. The economy was really hit by the Russian weaponization of, uh, of economy, Russian aggression against Ukraine. COVID, and many other things. So this was very uh, hard end of the, the third uh, decade. Um, what I can say is that the, the good luck is that we are part of the European Union, and that also pushes us through the agenda of modernization of digital economy, education, and greening of the economy. So everything which is dear to um, American hearts as well. Um, so I, I, I would say that the soul searching is continuing in, in the fourth, uh, fourth decade. Um, and uh, I hope it, it, it will be much brighter than any other. If I may, before taking questions, uh, th- thanks to my, my able, most able deputy and, and staff at the, at, the, at the embassy, we got hold of um, c- certain transcripts of uh, debates between uh, our presidents, I mean, Slovak and, and American. And um, let me quote only two paragraphs from the exchange between uh, President uh, Kovac and President Clinton from 21st April 
1993, when at the end of the encounter um, in the White House, my president said, we strongly support your policy towards Russia, the American policy. You can count on our participation in support of Russia. We also are very concerned about Ukraine. We have had uh, close traditional ties with Ukraine and may be able to help. I, I think Kovach was, was, was visionary and he knew what, what was uh, in, in stake. And um, President Clinton uh, replied, um, uh, replied very nicely with several sentences, but I will quote on only two. As long as you make progress towards the democracy, we will support you. As long as you try to make progress, we will be very supportive. Again, yeah, great. And, and the last uh, uh, piece of uh, President Clinton's uh, response to my president was, uh, in my small state of Arkansas, there is a small town of farmers called Slovak. All the people living there are from Slovakia. They are all great Catholic families. Every year I would go to this town and stand with the big farmers. They are all men of large stature like yourself. And you may re recall that President Kovac was really a big guy. I would serve oysters and talk with them. Not with the oysters, but with the Slovaks. <laughs> I would stay late into the night and hear stories about the old country of Slovakia. There are still many people in the United States with roots in Slovakia. They are wishing for your success. And on this, I would close my opening remarks, and I hope uh, to have a good exchange with you. But I think this was a fitting end to my uh, intro because I, I really admire both uh, late President uh, Kovac and President Clinton, who is in good health, in, in our neighborhood, uh, neighborhood in, in Calrama. Thank you, Ambassador. I, I think it was fascinating. And I, as, as you talk about President Kovac, I looked at the audience because uh, most of you um, have been part of a Slovakian success story. And I look specifically at uh, Tom Skladony, who is a founding member of Friends of Slovakia and who was also a public policy advisor to President Kovac, if I'm, if I'm not wrong. So thank you for your service, uh, sir. Uh, and again, each one of you has so much to offer. So I'd like to invite you, uh, our guests in the room, uh, to join the conversation with Ambassador. If you have any questions, of course, we prefer questions uh, to statements. Uh, please make your... <laughs> Make yourself known to the rest uh, of our guests. Uh, start with introducing yourself and then ask a question. Unless I see, and I see a hand raised, uh, uh, I will then go back to Ambassador with some of my questions. And I would like to specifically talk about the role of the United States uh, in the past 30 years of, um, of successful Slovak foreign policy. But let's go uh, to one of our guests uh, here uh, at the embassy first. Um, identifying myself, I'm David Frankel, um, a member of uh, the board of Friends of Slovakia. Thank you for this presentation tonight. My question is, uh, back in the early 1990s, I don't remember the exact date, but when uh, Vladimir Mechiar met with Václav Klaus and Brno to do what they did, had the results been different? I'm going to ask you to speculate here, which is something lawyers don't want people to do, but I'm going to ask you anyway to speculate. If instead of deciding to split Czechoslovakia into the Czech Republic and the Slovak Republic, if instead they came to an agreement that allowed the two countries to remain united as Czechoslovakia, what, what do you think Slovakia would look like today? What difference do you see other than the euro versus the crown? Because that's one difference. But anything else that you can think of if the countries remain together today? Uh, diplomats should not speculate as well. Uh, but but given, given the, the opportunity of uh, this uh, uh, occasion and, and debate, um, first of all, I, I think this was one of the least, the, the most undemocratic ways of splitting the country. Uh, usually, you would say, as, as a lawyer, uh, you, you, would, you would agree with me that you would ask people through the elections with specific mandates or through a referendum. When I look into uh, the mandates of, um, of uh, Václav Klaus and uh, Vladimir Mečer, uh, I don't recognize any mandate which was given to them to split the country. 
if there was, and uh, maybe the Czech colleagues here will would, would disagree that it was more on a, a Václav Klaus's part, but that's okay. That's my speculation and my my personal vision of 1992. Um, I don't think many from from a long term point of view, many things would would change. Um, at that time, uh, the circumstances were really ripe for a peaceful separation. And I would come earlier or later or sooner, sooner or later, whatever, you, which, uh, which, which, which side you would take. Um, there were too many things between the Czechs and Slovaks which would say, and, and, and I use the, the allegory of, um, or of the, the, the comparison with, with divorce. Divorce is always bad and a tragic thing. But I think this was a the positive divorce when uh, when finally Slovaks and Czechs would say, we have nobody else to blame for our failures. Nobody else, just us. And um, yes, maybe we would uh, stay there, uh, stay together in one, uh, in one state for longer. Um, if that would stay until joining EU, then it would probably have no reason for Slovaks to separate or Czechs to separate from the Slovaks to, to split. Uh, but I think that, that was just the... Given the circumstances of the of the early '90s and the way how people were the the political political elites of those two countries were looking at the possibility of of guarding Czechoslovakia to to keeping Czechoslovakia, these were totally incompatible, and it was way better for for both to to separate. So it was the this amicable split when the relationship between two people are much better outside or after the wedding as during the wedding. Um, so that that's a longish uh, answer, but if I would speculate even longer, I would I would say that the Czechs would have euro if we stayed in uh, in one country. Would press them to have euro. Other questions? Thank you. Gregory Pfeiffer, Institute of Current World Affairs. Uh, just a, a follow-up question uh, about your emotions. Uh, we're among friends, right? So we can speak honestly. What, what did you feel on, uh, on that day in, uh, in, in 1993? Thank you. Um, my, my, my wife, she, kn she knows me uh, almost uh, as long as I know Slovak Republic, um, uh, 30 years. Um, she knows that I'm a royalist. Uh, I'm not a Republican, uh, not with a capital or small r. No way. Uh, well, I am Republican with a small r, but a more royalist. Uh, I, I was feeling really sad because the, the, the heritage and the memories of the first Czechoslovak Republic were very strong. Pittsburgh Declaration, Joe Senko is here, so he is my personification of Pittsburgh and the cohabitation and collaboration of a Czech and Slovak exile. Uh, the success of the Czechoslovak Republic, um, uh, the the joint uh, fight against um, against uh, Nazism and um, being on on the correct side of the of of the, of the history all the time with the Czechs, um, that was a strong sentiment. So for me, it was like, gosh, I don't want this to end. Um, but then very soon came the realization that well, perhaps this, this is new opening, new new chance for. For, for a pursuit of happiness, one of the three founding uh, issues for the U.S. as well, the pursuit of happiness. Okay, let's do it. Let's let's not blame somebody else for for our mistakes and failures, and let's make our our country great again. Um, so my feelings were mixed. I didn't like it, um, but as a royalist, I, w I was like, okay, we have the crown back. Let let's keep it and let's let's cherish it. Some other questions from the audience here? Hi, I'm Ken Bombera, and I'm a chairman uh, of Friends of Slovakia. Um, I, kind of a comment, but you can comment on it. Um, back in, I think it was 2004, uh, Joe, if you'll recall that you and I uh, were asked by uh, Ambassador Kocher at the time to raise the flag, the EU flag, on the embassy, which we did. And I recall that Ambassador Kocher, of course, who's now foreign minister, um, 
in his in his little talk or his little speech, he commented that sort of the aspirations of Slovakia with joining the EU and NATO was was to uh, endeavor to become a normal, boring European country. So my question to you would be, what do you think? <laughs> was that achieved? Well, uh, I, I would, uh, well, ambassador never has to disagree with the foreign minister or head of state, uh, but I, I would I would disagree with the Rasta culture. With Ambassador Kaj, I would I would uh, disagree. No, 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 no. Um, to to have an aspiration to be a boring country in the middle of somewhere uh, that's that's sort of for forgettable stuff. Um, so yes, you want to have moments which you would like to forget, but uh, I, I think that Slovaks are able to create emotions. Um, you know, I, I I was in Lake Placid for the uh, University Winter Games, so I, I'm you can see in my Twitter how proud I am when Slovaks are beating the Americans and, and the rest. Uh, th this gives you emotion, and and I think on the, in in diplomacy as well and in state building, you need to create uh, emotions. The the Forbes description of Slovakia as a tiger of Europe that was that was creating a emotion. Um, to 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 describe the Slovakia as Detroit of world, uh, I'm scary. That's scary. I'm scared of that because we know how Detroit ended up. Um, uh, but Joe is uh, laughing about Pittsburgh. But uh, Pittsburgh was like uh, several years ago, a few decades ago. It was fuming, huffing and puffing, uh, a place with lots of uh, chimneys churning uh, stuff to to the air. I don't know whether it was a pleasant place to be. Most probably yes, because you stayed there. Um, but now Pittsburgh is a lovely city. It, it's a great booming city where um, economy is not defined by how many chimneys are huffing and puffing silly stuff to the air. It's about whether people are happy and able to educate their kids for the future. So I think now Slovakia is uh, exactly in the same position as, as, as Pittsburgh. Um, just get rid of those uh, old tall chimneys, put, put more universities in, um, more green economy, uh, more green te technologies, um, artificial intelligence, quantum, you, you name it. Just get, get out from, from, the, from, the, from the past and find uh, proper, uh, proper um, um, feelings um, and, and, uh, uh, about Slovakia. And, and I, I think that the, the slogan, Good Idea Slovakia, it's, uh, is something which creates emotions as well. It's, Whatever comes from Slovakia, it's a good idea. Um, I, I don't know whether it's, whether it's true, but at least it's uh, enlightening, uh, enlightening. So I, I would disagree with, uh, with the Rastro culture, and I would go like, we don't want to be boring part of the world. Thank you. And I, I want to go quickly back to the uh, Velvet Divorce, as everybody calls it. Uh, I just wanted to quote uh, our friend from Slovakia, Grigory Mesežniko, on what he said about the divorce recently. He said Czechoslovakia is still alive in the hearts and minds of the people, though um, uh, to different extent when it comes to Slovakia and the Czech Republic. See, I was ready for that question. I expected this. So I'm going to uh, quote also one of the most recent polls on this issue. And um, according to that poll, 91% of Slovaks and 86 Seven percent of Czechs still see themselves as closest allies. That's a good news. And then some 53% uh, percent of Slovaks, but only 35% percent of Czechs still feel that the division of Czechoslovakia was wrong. So just to give you some numbers uh, and a better sense of uh, what the feelings are in Central Europe. Um, I hope we will get a chance to talk uh, about some of the emerging uh, teams here. As, as you notice, Ambassador is a big uh, sports fan. Uh, we haven't had a chance to talk about the top NHL picks uh, this year, but hopefully we'll get to that. Slovakia has a lot to offer, whether it's cultural or economic ambassadors, accomplished uh, uh, foreign service officials. But I want to go back to the question I already uh, mentioned. Could we briefly talk about the role of the United United States uh, in the past 30 years of Slovakia and also maybe look a bit forward like where do you see our relationship going and I know you don't have a crystal ball uh, but because of what happened on February 24 last year the, the the relationship has has evolved I would say so can we briefly talk about that yeah I uh, I, I, I am I wouldn't I would not pretend to invent something more uh, than Pavel Demas already did in his um, booklets and books uh, 
a Slovakia US uh, partner friend and ally uh, friend partner and ally uh, I, I think this was uh, this is the best description of, of development of uh, Slovak American relationships um, um, and uh, you, you know I, I keep saying that uh, the the relationship didn't start 30 years ago it started well be before uh, Pittsburgh Declaration, Cleveland, uh, Cle- Cleveland Agreement, and Washington Declaration of Independence of, of Czechoslovak Nation. Um, uh, one of the first, uh, if, if you go to this, the census of immigrants to the United States in the 19th century, among the first nationalities which were recognized, of course, we're part of Hungary, and we never, never say, well, we're not part of Hungary. But once the census was dis- distinguishing not only the land or kingdom from where the, that person came, but also sort of a cultural identity, from that moment you can see Slovaks coming in. So there is a long, long history of Slovak-American relationship. Um, and I don't want to quote all the great names uh, who are connected uh, with, with Slovakia, but the closest to my heart now today is uh, Eugene Cernan, because finally we got... Uh, um, uh, printed out the, the Czech, uh, Slovak uh, uh, stamp, postal stamp, with Eugen Cernan uh, featuring uh, as the last Slovak on the moon. Um, so, so this is this is the past. But where where I, where I see Slovak American relationship is exactly in in three areas of uh, digital green and ed- education. Uh, there is a lot of things we can offer to each other. Um, and and I'm, I'm not talking about uh, Slovakia being the last EU member of the European Space Agency and the last European nation which launched the satellite to, uh, to the space. Um, but when you, when you see the young generation, young Slovaks uh, coming to the United States and find, uh, find their happiness in or through the United States, you see bright, uh, uh, bright, bright people who who, are, who come with uh, new technologies, new ideas. So I, I'm putting quite a good, good faith in, in, in that. That's number one. Number two, um, who else in these days when Russia is aggressively violating and uh, and really raping Ukraine? Uh, who are the best partners? That's the, those are the Europeans, and uh, I was really amazed by. And that was the, the proudest moment of, of the, the, the last uh, decade for me as a, as a professional diplomat, as, as a Slovak. The reaction of Slovak people to, to aggression of, of Russia, and I mean how we accommodated the Ukrainians, how we are helping to, to get Ukrainians on top of the um, agenda um, in, in their uh, liberating of, the, of, the, of their land. And everywhere here we have contacts with Americans, not, not only just who gets what, but how can we get it? To, to have a clean slate, and uh, whether it's in Panaga, whether it's the State Department, whether it's USAID, it's how to get it done better before. So for, for me, this is like ongoing partnership, maybe that there, there is not like a golden gem in somewhere in the middle, which I will say this is the, the moment, this is the holy grail of, of the Slovak-American relationship. Because the holy grail is the openness and frankness of, uh, of the debate. And Slovakia being sort of a springboard also for Americans who want to do their business in Europe and in Eastern Europe. Um, Slovakia is a calm and dull place to do business. I mean, calm and dull in, in a way that it's predictable. And you can jump from, from Slovakia, you can go to Western Balkans, you can do business in, in Ukraine. This is the hub which can be used. So we offer that to the United States, United States of offering us as well some opportunities. So let's grab it and um, go forward. Thank you. And I also recently heard former State Secretary, Foreign Minister uh, Ivan Korchuk talking about uh, how he sees gaps in trade, specifically in trade between United States, the European Union, and I guess it also applies to Slovakia, that there is uh, more that could be done. Um, I'll use this moment also to highlight um, a corporate partner of Friends of Slovakia, which is a successful Slovak startup uh, design company that developed a branding for our Slovakia 30 series, um, and uh, which has its arts on a display in a gallery, uh, which you've seen uh, on the way to the main hall. Um, our guests here at the embassy, they will be there for viewing for the rest of the year, and we want to thank them for their support as well. Uh, 
it's it's just impossible to avoid what's happening in Slovakia right now in terms of domestic politics for everyone who's following. You know that uh, Slovakia is heading towards early elections. And because I, I, I listened to a few of the podcasts and interviews that even uh, your own foreign minister, Rastislav Kacer, recently gave, I, I have to ask you, what, what should we expect in terms of foreign policy of Slovakia after the next elections? Are you firmly embedded in um, the, the space, political, geographically, of course, but political? Will there be any changes? To be, to be honest, uh, obviously, uh, each election can bring a change, uh, even here in the United States. Um, so there might be change. Um, to to talk about a, a sea change, I mean, like total, um, like, for example, when Vladimir Menchera was saying, well, okay, they don't want us in the West, so we'll, we'll return to the East. I don't think that this, this is going to happen. You may have uh, some parts of political spectrum which are um, more tolerant to Russian narratives and are somehow even actually actively promoting the Russian narratives. Um, these are only, for, from my point of view, these are re really short-lived um, tendencies. Uh, because if, if you want to do business, um, and to allow your people to, to pursue happiness, you don't go to study, with, with all respect to, to Russian universities, you don't just don't go there. You go to somewhere else. If you want to do re real and good forward-looking business, you may go to China. By, by all means, you can go to China. But if you want to do like, like top-notch business, you do it in the West. You do it with the US, you, would, you do it with the Britain, with the EU, EU uh, colleagues. But you don't do it on the east side of um, of, of Europe. Um, so the realities will sooner or later catch up with anybody who is trying to push these populist views that everything will be fine and Mother Russia will solve all the issues uh, for, for the Slovaks. Um, and and having seen reaction of the civic society in late 90s and after Jan Kuciak, I have full trust in in the Slovak community that once they will see the real um, real political goals of those who are questioning the the Slovak um, 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 Slovakia being embedded in in political West, they would just run away and said, "Hang on, guys, no, 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 this is not the way we, are, we want to do business." Um, so uh, until the elections, um, I'm I'm hundred percent sure that uh, the Government, although it, the, the president has more powers than before the uh, vote of non-confidence, the the collaboration between the head of state, between the president and the government, will continue totally unchanged. The full support to Ukraine, full support to uh, the economic changes and the reforms which are needed, they will be pushed through. Uh, elections are beautiful in democracy because the only thing you know the date. The, the latest date of the election, the rest you don't know. And knowing the Slovak uh, uh, community, I, 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 I believe that we will not slide in this pseudo-democracy where you have the latest possible election date, but you know the results. The only thing you, you don't know whether you will have three quarters majority or three quarters plus one majority. This is not the Slovak case. So uh, the democracy in Slovakia, as uh, President uh, Kovac was saying to, to President Clinton, the democratic institutions are there. They they will not budge. Uh, it they will may uh, they may have like lows and downs, ups and downs, uh, but that but they will survive. Uh, if if I may be a little bit adventurous and uh, un, unpleasant to the American hosts, uh, I came on the fifth of January uh, last year. Sorry, two two years ago. I would never yet imagine to see a second storming of the Congress. It happens only once in 200 years. So uh, democracy is not perfect, nowhere. Uh, but uh, to, to imply that Slovakia may totally turn away, um, that's a little bit outstretched for me. 
Thank you. There was a fall of uh, not democracy. Thank you for that. And uh, if you haven't read Ambassador's interview for Washington Diplomat, most recent, uh, make sure you do that. Uh, I believe you said that uh, January 6 was one of the most uh, important, like defining moments in your professional career. Um, so just a spoiler, I'm not going to go into further details. Um, hopefully everybody will have a chance to read that, read that interview. While I'm, I'm going to look at the questions uh, from the audience that we're receiving online, could I, could I maybe go back to you on, on the European Union again briefly? Um, and I, do, I know that all of us here in the room and online, we don't need a convincing. We all know that Slovakia has got an important uh, role to play, has its own foreign policy. But can you maybe give us a bit more detail, like help us understand what it is that Slovakia can do as the EU member? Um, um, it's it's uh, always uh, better to be around the table to read the menu than to be the menu. So that, that's that's the guiding principle of uh, of Slovakia being part of European Union. But uh, what 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 we can do, um, and what we are doing in, in European Union is, is strictly guarding our own Slovak um, um, interests and. Having economy heavily uh, dependent on manufacturing and automotive industry, for example, what we are doing quite actively is also lobbying here in the US to change some of the rules of the transatlantic trade and setting the standards for the uh, global trade and transatlantic trade on uh, electromobility. We we are. I I remember when when I was at the, one of the meetings and uh, we opened the. Um, debate on uh, the Inflation Reduction Act. And the American inter interlocutors were like, wow, so what, what's the problem? And we said, okay, um, you fancy electric cars, but if you want to buy under the rules of IRA, IRA, um, the European cars, for example, Volvo, you will not be able to do that because it will be extremely expensive because of the rules set by US, uh, US government and US Congress. So let's talk about how to have a a level play field for European producers in US and US in in, in, uh, in Slovakia. And obviously, as a small economy, we, we cannot influence the Congress or White House or anybody in in, uh, in in US. But as a part of European Union, teamed up with the other big, big economies, we were able to uh, to put the uh, put foot in, in into doors and of, of doors of, of uh, negotiation. And in December, the US and, and Europe the European Union had the, the debates on how to implement the IRA um, provisions so it will not harm European, and that means Slovak, uh, Slovak companies as well. Um, so we, we are pre pursuing quite, quite uh, um, many things, including the climate change. Um, uh, we, we know that the US will not adopt this, the same sort of climate change um, legislation because it's not the nature of the United States. But when, when talking, for example, to, to governor of, of California or left, left governor of, um, of Indiana or governor of Indiana, we can talk. We, we understand what we what, what we what we mean. And when they ask us, so what can you do in Europe? Well, okay, we will try to uh, steer the European legislation in a way that is beneficial for for both sides of Atlantic. The last, the third example I will, I will, I will just give you is the digital market. U.S. digital market is totally deregulated in, from the eyes of European uh, European diplomat. So again, as as a, a small country dependent on digitalization, we want the European legislation not to be harm to U.S. service providers like Amazon and the rest, Google, but we want to through European legislation and our national views of how we can benefit from that influence what's what's debated here in the U.S. So it's a long shot, uh, but we we, we are. We're using the EU as a tool to uh, to uh, enforce our own national interests um, of, of economy. Thank you. And I know that there are many other examples of uh, legislative pieces that you initiated from from within. So you're trying to reform, like improve European uh, Union also from inside uh, to make it better for, for your own constituents. Uh, I'll just say the prime example is the legislation on ultimate beneficial ownership and anti-corruption reforms. Uh, so I want to congratulate you uh, on that. And many, many successful Slovaks are now uh, representing 
think not necessarily Slovakia, they are independent uh, from the administration, but are in high-level positions in Brussels at the EU. Same goes for uh, organizations here in the US and elsewhere, and I'll just highlight the latest appointment of Slovak uh, ambassador to the United Nations as a deputy director, I believe, at UN Habitat. So congratulations to Michal Mlinar, also to New York. Um, and there is much more, again, that uh, we could share with our audience, but uh, if you allow me to quickly ask you, uh, I, I'm, I'm afraid, probably a last question, uh, which is coming from our online audience. Would you mind um, elaborating a bit on the extent of foreign influence in Slovakia? And the question was very specific. Uh, our, um, our participant asked uh, about the extent as far as media, civil society, and even government is concerned. But I leave it up to you to decide uh, which, uh, which one you want to uh, pick or uh, which way you want to take this question. Thank you. Yes, um, uh, th th this is a really important uh, question and uh, coming to election period of time, it's uh, even more important to understand what sort of influences are there in, in Slovakia. I was chatting uh, with somebody before um, sit sitting down over here on the podium that um, I was influenced by foreign, uh, foreign agents uh, before the fall of Berlin Wall, um, listening to Voice of America and Free, uh, free Europe, Radio Free Europe. But that was sort of a different influencing. It was just um, offering me and and uh, the Czechoslovak citizens a different view, you know, access to information. Uh, now nowadays, when you look into this information or information space of Slovakia, you have many agents you know, who are deliberately spreading false narratives about Slovak society, about what's going on around Slovakia. And the largest disseminators of, of these disinformation are either willing or unwilling or useful idiots of, of agents from Russia. And I'm, I'm not, not saying who from Russia, but from Russia. And just, just, just to give, give you one, 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 uh, one example, one, one number, the, the number of Facebook and Telegram encounters in Slovakia, which are... Mm, feed it in and we, which are which are started from Russian environment are 10 times more than in Germany and Germany is way bigger than Slovakia so why on earth Russia is or the Russian sources are paying so much attention to Slovakia as an engineer as, as somebody who grew up with mathematics and physics you are looking for the weakest link so Russia is exploiting possible weakest link in Slovakia to just disrupt the uh, unity of European Union, the sanctions which are against Russia uh, because of the aggression, and, and just, just to dilute any you know, firmness in, in NATO and, and European Union. The same may go for, uh, for agents coming from, from China who really don't like to see the malign, um, I don't want to say influence, but malign activities of, of Chinese companies which are bound by the Chinese law to perform cert certain actions. Um, uh, and they, they obviously don't like to be barred from access to the Slovak market, although it's only 5.5 million people, but it opens the gate to the European Union. So you, we, we don't have lots of Chinese influence, but, but there is. But the majority is really influence fueled from Russia, just aiming at the, um, at the people to... To, to, to disseminate distrust in institutions. And this is exactly as President Clinton was saying, if you want to, to, to make your society more democratic, we will help you, we'll be there for you. To, if you want to loosen your democracy, if you want to uh, undermine it, you are gone for the US. You will once again become black hole in Europe. Um, so there is a huge influence. We, we are w uh, well aware of that. And I'm, I'm really um, proud that the, the Minister of Foreign Affairs and European, Europe, European Affairs is one of the leaders, together with the Ministry of Defense, which is scary when Defense is Ministry of Defense is doing uh, um, uh, hybrid warfare, uh, at least in the mind of some people. That we are really one of the for, forerunners, including with my president and my prime minister, just exposing these agents of evil who are disseminating distrust in uh, in, in society, in institutions who are promoting systemic corruption, the uh, intertwining and, and, and merger between 
um, organized crime, judiciary, police, and the rest. We had it in, in, in the last decade of Slovak, uh, in the third decade of Slovak independence, we had this systemic corruption. And they want just to use it to uh, to influence uh, uh, Slovak society, and have a, a regime which is more lenient to 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 Russian interests. And I have to say that the Russian interests are not necessarily Slovak, and most of the time they are contradictory. So what we are doing is is not guarding European or American interests. The, we are guarding our own Slovak interests, which happen to be the same as the American and contrary to to Russian. Um, so it's it's a uh, it's a very very complicated and it's not easy a task to to fend off these this, this information and uh, foreign influence uh, and things got to the change of narrative and th change of thinking in in meta and google and youtubes um in facing all these um um threats coming from dissemination of of this information we are still way from what we as bureaucrats would love love to and europeans would love to see as as outcome but at least that these big companies are talking to to our prime ministers, to our ministers, to our high level uh, people. That's a good sign that they understand the problem, and that problem is not only the content, because you can moderate the content. But the problem is misuse of the tools, which were originally um, designed to sell more products, to give you more advertising, uh, to to do harmless things. But tools of of Amazon, Google, YouTube, and you know, and address they are misused by by agents like Moscow, sometimes by by China and, and others to undermine um, trust of people in institutions. And that's the core of uh, of democracy. You have to trust the institutions, and you have to have it. you have to have a trust in institutions. Which is, of course, not easy to achieve. But thank you very much. That was a very extensive uh, response to a very important question. I will only uh, add to that that for everyone who is interested in um, in this topic specifically in greater detail, make sure to follow uh, one of the uh, most prominent European think tanks, which happens to be based in Slovakia. It's one of the most successful Slovak projects, uh, Globsec. Um, uh, I, I guess everyone in this room and hopefully also online has heard about it, but I would definitely recommend following them on these and other important issues. With that, I'm unfortunately afraid that we reached uh, our time together. I want to be mindful of everyone's time. And uh, we also have a reception um, ready, prepared for, for our um, guests here at the embassy. So if you allow me, I'll at this point uh, conclude by thanking, of course, uh, Ambassador for his remarks. But I also want to thank uh, everyone here in the room and online uh, for it, the privilege of your time. Uh, we also hope you'll be able to join us for our second event on domestic politics uh, with a professor of uh, political science from the Bain State University, Kevin Degan Kraus, on February 23rd. Again, it was a tremendous pleasure for us uh, to have you here or online. Thank you, Ambassador, again, and we're looking forward to seeing you again. Thank you. Someone please uh, grab the welcome drink in the back and in the meantime we'll prepare the space for the reception. Thank you.